Today we've got a video on the US's World War 3 plan. So uh, yeah, this is going to be pretty interesting. Let's just show you to this one. Russia's on the warpath, and if successful in Ukraine is unlikely to stop there. Lithuania, with EU support, has shut off the flow of military and economic material to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, triggering a threat of invasion by Russia in retaliation. The right. world away, China flexes its muscles as it threatens the United States and their continued support for Taiwan. Fears of World War III are growing by the day, and the United States is taking them very, very seriously. Before we discuss how the US is preparing for the Third World War, first we need to know what its potential enemies are doing. China has long been preparing for a confrontation with the US as it seeks to become the world's dominant superpower. Currently, really? China falls short of the qualifications for a global superpower. Like, I'm not I'm not surprised with uh, China prepared for that, but I just didn't know. I, I, I never see anything on China in the media. Right? Qualifications which only the US fills at the moment. But with its dizzying economic and military growth, it might be less than a decade before the Chinese Communist Party can project power all over the world. Chinese right. preparations for a showdown with the West include dislodging the United States as the most important economic power in the world. It also has safeguards to its own economic interests in the wake of economic warfare versus the US. And to achieve this aim in 2013, it launched the Belt and Road Initiative. This massively ambitious that? plan included building new land and sea trade routes all over the world to connect China economically with nations all the way from Europe to Africa. To achieve this, huh? the nation has not just invested in its own infrastructure, but in building trade infrastructure in other nations as well. However, China's partnership with host nations is more often than not extremely predatory. They offer economic loans to build massive projects that promise economic prosperity, like seaports and rail yards. However, the terms of those loans often dictate that Chinese companies must be hired to do the construction, leaving few jobs for locals. Interest rates on the debt traps is often so high that a poor third world nation is guaranteed to default. Included in the penalties for defaulting are clauses such as China owning exclusive rights to the infrastructure it builds for terms Honestly, of China, I need to watch like a whole entire video on China because China is super interesting with how they run things and how everything is done over there. And, um, as long yeah. as a century. I need to watch all it is, in effect, a modern version of soft colonialism. China's plan is to have heavy influence in the trade of goods throughout Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, putting it in a very strong position to dictate geopolitics in its ever-growing sphere of influence. China's next preparation for war with the U.S. includes securing its vulnerable trade routes through the South China Sea and the very valuable oil and natural gas deposits in the region, as well as the remaining rich fishing grounds. This effort began with the construction of artificial islands in 2013, which mm -hmm. continued unopposed despite an international ruling by the World Court in The Hague that such island building and claims to economic exclusion zones around them were illegal. Foreign pressure also failed to stop China from stealing claims to oil supplies by neighbors such as Vietnam, or of using its Coast Guard to bully and intimidate the merchant and fishing fleets of other nations out of their own territorial waters. These islands have now become heavily fortified military installations, which include modern missile defenses, runways long enough for long-range attack aircraft, and an ever-growing network of surveillance assets, all geared for one purpose. Oh shit! Protect, track, and destroy the U.S. Navy. Further but preparations they don't do have that. the addition of dozens of new ships. Is that like, is that really what they're like there for? Because I've never heard of anything of that. ...to the People's Liberation Navy, which is now officially the largest in the world. Recently, China's second aircraft carrier came online, and in a few years, will be ready for battle, greatly enhancing the CCP's reach in all the important... Bro, why are they talking like US and China are at war right now? Like, they're talking like, Yo, oh yeah, they got this ship and it's ready for battle in like two years to fight the US. Like, it's not gonna, like, as soon as they make this, it's not gonna instantly fight the US or... And that's why I'm missing something, bro. I've been living under a rock. With Russia's increased belligerence in Europe, there's a serious concern that the two nations might partner up in an attempt to turn the current US-led world order on its head. Despite yep. China's increasing capabilities, it still does not have the power to defeat the US in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, and it might hope to split the US attention by partnering with Russia, thus forcing America to choose fighting between China in the Pacific or Russia in Europe. For decades, the United States maintained a policy of- Hey, hey, US, don't worry, boys. You got, you got NATO, right? I'm pretty sure NATO will deal with Russia whilst you guys deal with China. Yeah. As long as nukes aren't being used, should be a problem. Fielding a powerful enough military to fight and win two simultaneous wars against near-peer adversaries. However, with China's rapid ascension, this has become officially impossible without bankrupting the US. 
and thus America has been forced to accept that it may only be able to defeat <laughs> one near-peer adversary at a time. The question is, how was the US preparing to do that? given the increasing likelihood of China and Russia starting a third world war. Oh, First, the situation sake. in the Pacific might seem dire with China's numerically superior navy, but the real measure of naval power is not the number of vessels, but in the number of battle force missiles. Yeah. These are the number of missiles that both navies can bring to bear against each other. The US maintains around 10,000 missiles versus the PLAN's Holy estimated 2,000. Though those numbers have changed and will continue to change as China fields larger vessels and both navies shift in composition. It's estimated that by- I just love- <laughs> I love these fucking screams in these videos, man. By 2030, China might have closed the gap in battle force missiles to two-thirds of US capabilities. The US's first line of defense against China is the place that's likely to be ground zero for World War III, Taiwan. The small island democracy broke away from the mainland after the nationalists were expelled by the communists in the aftermath of World War II. Since then, the former dictatorship has become a vibrant democracy that has refused to reunify and put themselves under control of the Chinese Communist Party. Securing Taiwan is not just important for the ever-intensifying global clash between authoritarianism and democracy, but also for very important political and economic reasons. Firstly, Taiwan produces around 50% of the world's semiconductors after US companies ceased production at home due to expense. Oh, shit. Semiconductors are important for every single gadget in your life. The global economy quite literally runs on them and they've become as valuable as a commodity as gas and oil. Oh, China shit. itself produces between 25 and 30% of the world's semiconductors. Damn, so Taiwan produces 50%? It, what, what, um, it'd be really helpful if you guys could comment, like, I know there's a lot of issues with China and Taiwan, and in this video, they might go into more detail, but I doubt it. Uh, if you guys could comment more of the issues that's going into, like, between these two countries, and what's exactly happening. Cause I can remember in the news I was talking about like China was gonna invade Taiwan and this and that, but they never did. A conductor supply. So if China were to take them. Taiwan, it would now be in control of three quarters of the global semiconductor supply. This yeah, would allow China to effectively shut down the economy of any nation that disagrees with it by simply barring the sale of semiconductors to it, giving China incredible power to further control global affairs and reducing the West's ability to oppose its authoritarianism. Taiwan is also politically important, as it makes up part of what's known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of islands that extends from Japan to the Philippines and acts as a very physical barrier to the expansion of Chinese influence in the Pacific. If China were to take Taiwan, it would not just break this carefully orchestrated containment strategy, but allow China to effectively neuter Japan's ability to resist it. With aircraft and ships stationed off Taiwan, China could target Japan's lines of communication and trade routes that cross the Pacific and hem the nation in, forcing it into subservience under threat of economic starvation. If China takes Taiwan, the US commitments to defend the Philippines and Japan would be made much more difficult, if not impossible. To defend Taiwan, the US has inked several deals, selling the nation advanced weapon systems ranging from fighter aircraft to air and missile defenses. US oh, military shit. advisors have worked closely with the Taiwanese counterparts for years to prepare the nation for invasion. Despite threats from China, the flow of US arms to Taiwan continues unabated, and recently US President Joe Biden publicly voiced for the first time an unacknowledged truth in American politics. The United States will come to the defense of Taiwan in oh, case damn. of invasion. This greatly angered China and the White House press corps was quick to walk the statement back. But what seemed like a political guffaw was likely yet another bit of intrigue meant to further the American strategy of keeping China guessing as to how the US might react to an invasion. If China cannot accurately predict what America will do should it invade Taiwan, it serves to create confusion and doubt mm. amongst Chinese leadership. Should China prepare its economy for a flurry of global sanctions like Russia received after its invasion of Ukraine? Or should China expect American F-18s to swarm the skies over Taiwan and sink their invasion fleet? Strategic ambiguity is a powerful tool, and political theater is an excellent method for creating. But, but the US is not planning on fighting a war against China alone. To this end, it has helped increase the capabilities of allies such as Japan and most notably Australia, who recently signed a military cooperation pact between itself, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The pact will not just provide security cooperation between the countries, but also help arm Australia with a fleet of nuclear attack submarines. This is of grave concern to the Chinese, who recently attempted to charm Australia away from its relationship with the US, a tactic which ultimately failed. In 10 years' time, China might not have to face off just against the US and British submarines, but Australian submarines also, 
putting the People's Liberation Navy as well as its all important. Yeah, no, it like, honestly, with like Australia, America, UK, and the rest of goddamn NATO, bro, right? They've got no chance. Like, they, they, they'll be absolutely stupid to fucking want to even go to war, right? Especially after the US coming out and saying then they will defend Taiwan, right? The only way, the only way US, America, well, America, Australia, and all, you know, all those countries lose is if it goes to a nuclear war, because then everybody loses. But if it doesn't go to that, then yeah, what, like, the, it, it doesn't make sense why you would want to. Sea trade routes at increased risk. China imports most of its oil and gas over its seaborne trade routes, and this is exactly what the US is preparing to target in case of war in order to strangle the Chinese economy. Recently, security meetings between Japan, India, the US, and Australia were revived after a pause during President Trump's term. The Quad, as it's informally known, aims to tackle global problems such as global warming, cybersecurity, and ensuring a free and open trade environment in the Pacific. Hell this yeah. is a veiled implication of the Quad's discussions oh. on how to best handle China's expansion in the South Pacific. Currently, the Quad has no military commitment to each other, but that might change in the future. As I'm very surprised to not see UK here. Why is... Is the UK not big enough? I thought, I thought the UK was pretty strong. Are they not? <laughs> why, are they, why, why is it no like fucking uh, five battle? Why are we not uh, making the quad into a fifth? Or President some shit? Joe Biden makes the South Pacific and confronting China an area of pressing concern for the US. India is the only nation in the quad without a formal security agreement with the US, and it has historically refused to sign on to any security partnerships with any nation. However, that may soon change as tensions between India and China escalate. And it becomes oh, clear that India is not able to win a war against the superior Chinese military on its own. Bringing India into the network of security alliances in the South Pacific would effectively hem China in on all sides, and more importantly put allied ships and planes directly in the path of China's trade routes through the Indian Ocean. But the United States is also taking very material steps to confronting China. War with China would be waged at sea and in the skies, with very little of any action between the People's Liberation Army and the US Army. This will be a war of ships and planes, not of tanks and artillery, and the US is preparing accordingly. In an attempt to prepare for a confrontation with China in the skies, the US has accelerated the procurement of F-35s and made getting squadrons of the fifth generation fighter into operational status a top priority. However, both the Navy and the Air Force have expressed reservations about the F-35's current readiness, which has prompted both the services to supplement orders of F-35s with orders of upgraded legacy aircraft such as the F-15 Eagle for the U.S. Air Force and the F-18 Super Hornet for the U.S. Navy. Right, the thing is, right, why would China even want to do this? Like, yeah, I get that China is a powerful country, right? Good military, all of that. But it's the fucking U.S., bro. I'm not even from America. It's the U.S. You don't want to, you don't want to fuck with the U.S. You don't want to fuck with the U.S. What if they ever lost? I don't, I don't know. Comment down. What if they ever lost? They don't lose. They're too strong, they're too big, they focus way too much of their budget on, on the military. Way too powerful. Um, a lot. Of this, what, this is a good point. Uh, a lot of people are proud to fight for America, right? Uh, I'm sure that, that's the same in other countries, but, you know, it seems like they're very proud. So they're very well trained. They're very determined. Bro, why? 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 Yeah. <laughs> bro, why? They, they wouldn't even risk going to war with US. Like, bro, you're just gonna lose, man. To counter the threat of Chinese missiles, including its very vast arsenal of ballistic missiles capable of targeting US ships far out at sea, the Navy has also begun to expand the number of Aegis-equipped vessels in its fleet. Starting in 2015, the Navy also began to work on undoing the strategy of carrier-based sea dominance that it's employed since the end of the Cold War. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the US Navy enjoyed unmatched superiority and complete freedom of action anywhere in the world, and thus surface fleets were retasked with simply protecting carriers. Anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare skills had atrophied as naval strategy centered completely around the big carriers. Now the US Navy is preparing its crews to once again face off against near-peer foes and ship-to-ship -ship battles. Submarines are America's second greatest naval asset after aircraft carriers, and yet remain nearly completely forgotten by most of the world, which is exactly how they like it. 
Currently, the U.S. has a Damn. fleet of 68 submarines and is replacing the Cold War Los Angeles class fast attack lot? submarines with the new Virginia class. Investment in submarines has stalled recently and procurement plans are behind schedule, but the United States retains a significant advantage in undersea combat, despite China having a larger force of less advanced submarines. The realm of hypersonic missiles has received a great deal of attention ever since it was announced that the U.S. was lagging behind both Russia and China in their development. Yet there's some misinformation and confusion regarding this technology that's made Russia and China seem as if they hold a significant advantage over the U.S. in this realm when they really don't. Firstly, any ballistic missile is hypersonic, and China's recent test that saw a hypersonic missile fly around the world is not very impressive from a military point of view. Technically speaking, this simply doesn't add any additional capability that didn't already exist. The real threat from hypersonic missiles comes from maneuverable hypersonics. These are missiles that can not only fly at hypersonic speeds, but can also maneuver while doing so, making what them the incredibly fuck? difficult to defend against. In this area, all three nations are still struggling to field fully operational missiles, but the U.S. has made great strides in recent tests. One area where the U.S. may in fact be coming up short is the development of advanced long-range air-to-air missiles. Recent photos of Chinese jets show that China has begun to field advanced beyond visual range missiles, while the U.S. is still largely equipped with the AIM-120, an extremely capable and combat-proven air-to-air missile that nevertheless is only effective at medium ranges. However, the Pentagon's F-3R program aims to improve the capabilities of American air-to-air -air missiles. Yo, what is this video doing to me, bro? Because, listen, listen, listen. I like I've seen a lot of these like war videos and I I, I always say what's the point of war no point having you know go to war it's fucking stupid right you don't want anyone to go to war you don't want civilians on either side to die um because like the government's disputes and shit but this video why the fuck is it getting me hyped bro I'm like yo I want to see US versus China bro. like why am I getting hyped to see like who would win in US versus China like <laughs> What's going on? By not just greatly expanding their the range, music but also shit. improving efficiency in an electronically contested environment. A new generation of American missiles will feature two-way data links, GPS-enhanced inertial measurement units, an expanded no-escape envelope to increase lethality, and improved high-angle off-bore sight capability, allowing pilots to fire missiles without their plane being pointed directly at the enemy, thus lowering their vulnerability. However, the next step for U.S. fighters is the AIM-260, which will feature beyond visual range capabilities and match longer range opposition missiles while bringing the tried and true technologies of the AIM-120. But World War III will also likely involve action against Russia in- Right, we don't know what they have behind the scenes and shit, but like on paper, the US is just ahead in every way, in every way, shape or form. You know what I mean? I don't know if fucking China's got some killer robots or US has got some killer robots. They might, you know, they have, they have secret projects and shit, but- In Europe as yeah. China and Russia are both likely to cooperate in such a scenario. This will be a partnership of opportunity, however, not of choice, as relations between the nations are difficult at best, and Russia grows increasingly frustrated at its status as the junior partner. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has proven itself incompetent. Bro, that's what I was just going to say. I was going to say, if you take away Russia's nukes, they've got no chance. Like, them, you know, invading Ukraine, shout, like, Good shit on Ukraine, bro, because they've proven themselves to be, you know, strong and uh, determined and stuff. And uh, um, what's the, what's the word I'm looking? I, I can't, I can't, I don't know the word I'm looking for. But what I'm saying is, is Russia? They seem to like be so strong in their military. Go to Ukraine and really struggle. Like, you know what I mean? And Ukraine isn't the biggest of militaries. So they, they got no chance. Like, without their nukes, it, yeah. Corrupt and inept at executing a modern 21st century war. Despite vastly superior firepower, the Russian offensive in Ukraine has all but stalled out. And this is with Russian forces facing a foe that has a fraction of the capabilities of the US military. Simply put, the only real threat Russia can bring to a global war scenario is their nuclear power. With the bulk of Literally the US Army said. not taking part in operations in the Pacific, Take Russia would nukes be easily nothing. contained by current US ground firepower while NATO would be short on critical air assets. These are capability gaps easily filled in by NATO air forces. Four months ago, we would have spent an additional 10 minutes explaining to you how the US is preparing to counter Russia. Today, after seeing what the Russian military is capable of, we honestly don't have to. While victory would come at a cost, NATO would most likely win a resounding oh, victory shit. over the Russian armed forces. The only real threat Russia would pose Yo, hey, listen, listen, listen. Don't let Putin see this video, bro, because he will be 
piss. Yo, if they see the video, like, imagine the president of the United States is like, yo, four months ago, listen, Russia, we, we would have prepared to fight you, right? Now we don't have to, man. Now we don't have to, right? We, we're chilling. We don't have to. We've seen what you're capable of, you know, fight work. We're just, send, we're just sending Naval SEAL Team 6, and uh, yeah, jobs are good on. Would be in the first few weeks as the bulk of American firepower is being shipped across the Atlantic and prepared for battle. This leaves the Baltics and Poland vulnerable, but the deployment of NATO Rapid Response Forces would likely be enough to slow down an initial Russian offensive and greatly limit its gains until NATO's European partners can fully mobilize their own armies. U.S. strategy to counter Russian aggression in the next world war is thus based around preparing European partners to better defend their own continent and not be so reliant on the U.S. military, as the conflict against China will consume the bulk of U.S. sea and air power. The Pacific is where the real war will play out, and after its stunning losses in Ukraine, it's unlikely Russia would willingly engage NATO in a third world war anyway. Now go check yeah. out World War III yeah. hour by hour, or click this other video instead. Damn, really, really, really good video. I actually enjoyed that one. That was actually a really interesting video. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure you leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.